name's Tom Schwartz, I'm the director, and you're in for a wonderful treat today. It's uh, probably one of the best ways to learn about history in uh, one of the most enjoyable and memorable ways, and that is through presenters. Um, I've known Robert Davis for many years. We've served on the Abraham Lincoln Association board together. Robert has had a very distinguished career in uh, the private sector and then served uh, at the state of Illinois with the Nat Nat Department of Natural History, or excuse me, Department of Natural Resources. It used to be called the Department of Conservation uh, for um, the, the end of his career. And uh, he, his ancestors obviously were slaves and from that experience he began to do reading and research and came across this very unique figure in history, uh, Andrew Lewis. And a slave who was born in Kentucky, moved to Missouri, was uh, sold to a master in Missouri, escaped to freedom in Quincy, Illinois, and then enlisted in the 29th Illinois Colored Infantry. Keep in mind, Rob, Bob is going to be in character so that he will do his performance and then take questions from the audience. I'll pass this microphone to you. Remember to have it and to talk into it <laughs> when you ask your question. But keep in mind, he's back in time. So if you ask him a question in present time, he's not going to understand it. Okay? All right? He will then go out of character um, for some of those questions that you might have, you know, asking him where, where he needs to talk, refer to present time. But for the most part, you know, he's going to be back in the 19th century uh, with his character, Andrew Lewis. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Robert Davis as Andrew Lewis. who, in a speech in Philadelphia in 1861, urged President Lincoln and the Lincoln administration to let the black man join that Civil War fight for union and freedom. He went on to say that, once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters U.S., let him get an eagle on his button, a musket on his shoulders, and bullets in his pockets. And there is no power on earth that can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship in the United States. Today, standing before you in this old blue uniform helps me to remember how we fought for our freedom and the freedom of our people. You see, that civil war was a terrible war with brothers fighting brothers and cousins fighting cousins and masters fighting slaves, and slaves fighting right back, fighting masters. Folks just killing each other. Well, I'm glad that war is over, but we had to have that fight. God knows that for union and freedom, we had to get rid of that slavery. 
Now sometimes when I talk about this, I tend to get a little emotional. And I tend to get ahead of myself. So I suppose I should start by saying who I am. I'm Private Andrew Lewis, member of the Illinois 29th Infantry, the United States Colored Troops. I'm also a veteran of the Civil War. I was born about 1833, a slave on a plantation in Kentucky. Now, I don't know much about my family, but I do remember my grandma. She had a kind heart and a strong spirit. She said that when I was just a little fellow, they sold my daddy further south to one of those large cotton plantations where they work you to death, working you from sun up to sundown. And then when I was five, about six years old, they sold my mama to a slaver. Now, we don't know where they took her. All we know is that she was screaming and she was crying as they put her in those chains and tied her behind that wagon and led her away. We all cried. And then, when I was 11, about 12 years old, they sold me to a slave. And I remember my grandma placing her arms on my shoulders and saying, Joseph, somebody in this family is going to be free. And Joseph, that somebody is you. Don't know how, don't know where, don't know when. But the Lord done told me that you're going to be free. She said that with such passion and as though she were praying that she burned the notion of freedom deep within my soul. And I was determined to see her dream come true. <clears throat> well... That slaver sold me to a Mr. Andrew Lewis from, from uh, Marion County, from Miller Township, Marion County, Missouri. Now Marion County is right on the border of the Mississippi River. So once you cross that Mississippi, you cross over into Quincy, Illinois. Free land, free territory. Now I hated that slavery because all they wanted to do was to break your will, to break your spirit, to break your determination to live free as God had intended for his creation to be free. So, you know, and, and they use murder, rape, brutality, they ripped apart families, all those things to let the slave know his place. So, about 1860, 1861, about the time this fight broke out, I ran to freedom. But I escaped to freedom with the help of some of those decent common folk and some of those underground railroad and abolitionist folk. And I remember how for several days and nights how they hid me in that barn and in that cellar and, and in that cave and gave me a shirt to keep warm and some food to eat. But on that last night, they told me to go down to that river, to get into that boat, to keep down, and to keep quiet. They told Perkins, another runaway slave that I met that night for the first time, to get into that boat, to keep down, and to keep quiet. Now the reason they did that was because it was against the law to help a slave run to freedom. And you see, those decent common folk, they could have gone to jail, they could have lost their property, or even worse. But the next thing I remember were those white men rowing us across that Mississippi River, rowing us towards the Illinois side, rowing us towards freedom. And when I stepped out on that soil up there in Quincy, I dropped to my knees, remembering Grandma and thanking God. And about that same time, as I looked up, I saw an expression on that other slave's face, Perkins, an expression that I hadn't seen before. And it was a while before he told us what that meant. Well, 
It was some of those same decent common folk who helped me to find work as a field hand working on, uh, working on a farm right outside of Quincy. And also helped me to find work repairing that old German Baptist church in downtown Quincy, which became the first colored Baptist church in 1865, the year the war ended. Yeah. And it was at that church, that's where I met the Reverend Holmes. Now, the Reverend Horn, he was one of those highly educated colored men. He was a preacher who became our teacher. And the Reverend made it clear early on that one of his objectives was to prepare us men for that fight that was going on. Because he said that one day our time was coming. Now, the Reverend, he was a Lincoln man. And he loved to quote Mr. Lincoln's house divided speech. You know, the one where Mr. Lincoln had said that a house divided against itself cannot stand. That it had to be all of one thing or all of the other. All of this or all of that. And the Reverend loved to use that house divided theme in his sermons. I remember one of his earlier sermons when he said, how can you say, as said in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, when over here, you have perpetual or ongoing slavery, where the mothers are slaves, the children are slaves, the grandchildren are slaves, and on and on forever. In the words of Mr. Lincoln, that's your house divided. On the one hand, you have God's gift of free will to mankind, but on the other, you have the evilness of slavery, where the slave is robbed of the fruits of his labor, and then robbed of his soul. The Reverend said that at some point, those two forces, they had to get at each other. And that's why this fight's going on. Look, what do you say to that mother whose children have been snatched from her arms and sold? A mother who goes throughout life bearing the pain of always wondering but never knowing what has happened to her babies. For our children, for our wives, and for our freedom, we had to get into that fight. Now, the Reverend used that house divided theme again when he talked about the free states and the slave states. And today, I'm just going to mention those two. The slave states he identified as Alabama and Arkansas, Tennessee and Texas, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, and of course, Virginia, where the bulk of the Civil War was fought. But then he went on to talk about four other slave states, which they call the border states. Maryland, Kentucky, Delaware, and of course, Missouri, where I had escaped from. He, he, then he had identified the free states, starting with the six New England states. And you know what those are. Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. And as you roll further west, you picked up New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and out there on the far west coast, that was California. But the Reverend said that, let's be clear on something. He said that the root cause, the basic cause, the fundamental cause of this fighting that's going on is over the question of slavery. 
And he said that if you are ever challenged, you tell them to go back and read the secession agreements that were made by the individual uh, states as they seceded from the Union. They made it clear in those secession ordinances that they were seceding based upon the fundamental principle of slavery. Now, he also taught us that the free states and the slave states, that they tried to reconcile their differences over this question of slavery. And they came up with three great compromises within the United States Congress. The first compromise was the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Now, under the Missouri Compromise of 1820, the Congress said that for every free state that petitions and is allowed to come into the Union, a slave state can come into the Union. So as to maintain that balance of power, especially within the United States Senate. Maine was allowed to come into the Union as a free state, and to offset that, Missouri came into the Union as a slave state. Again, to maintain that balance of power. But there was another stipulation, and that stipulation said that slavery could not extend above the 38th parallel, 30 minutes north longitude, which many of us know as the Mason-Dixon line. But during that period, there was a lot of pressure to extend slavery out into the territories, especially given that Louisiana land purchase of 1803, which included the state of Iowa, as well as the Kansas and Nebraska territories. So there came a need for another compromise, and that was the compromise of 1850, he told us. He said that under the Compromise of 1850, then the Congress uh, let California come into the Union as a free state. And to offset that, they passed that evil Fugitive Slave Act, which gave those slavers legal authority to go anywhere within the Union, to run down, to track down former slaves, runaway slaves, and to drag them back south into slavery. It also gave those slavers legal authority to deputize local folk and local communities to help them to identify, locate, capture, and hold former slaves, runaway slaves, and to drag them back south into slavery. But let me tell you how the system was stacked against the slave. Yeah. For, those, for those men and women who said that they were not slaves, but they were free black men and women, then in order to, you know, to address their grievances, they couldn't go into the court system because the government wouldn't allow that. So, but they allowed them to go before, uh, before arbitrators assuming that they had someone white to speak for them. Now, the arbitrator, if he ruled in favor of the person who said, or who was accused of being a slave, then the arbitrator received $6 in compensation. Mm -hmm. But, if the arbitrator ruled in favor of the slave catcher, then the arbitrator received $10 in compensation. So the whole system was stacked against the slave. See, that whole slave catching industry was a very powerful and a very lucrative industry. But one of those things that those slaves did, they grabbed a number of free men and women, drugged them south, and sold them into slavery. And that's what happened to Perkins. Remember that other slave that I said came over the boat with me? Perkins, free man, always been a free man. He and his family, his wife and children, free people. On the way from church one Sunday, some slavers jumped him. Said that y'all are slaves, and we're gonna take y'all back south in the slavery. Perkins said, no, no, we're not. We're free, we're free people. And if you don't believe us, let's just go over to the courthouse so you can check our freedom papers. See, at that time, almost every northern state required 
that free black men and women register their freedom papers at the local courthouse so that nothing could be said. But in this case, those slavers, they have none of it. So they got to fight. And they club Perkins so bad that he floated in and out of consciousness. But by the time he got his wits together, he was in the South, in chains. His wife had been sold, his young daughter had been sold, his young son had been sold. He got to squabbling with them some more. They beat him, but ultimately sold him. And see, it was situations like that that infuriated those uh, abolitionists and people like Senator Sump uh, 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 Sumter from Massachusetts. But it also began to, to really you know, rank and, 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 uh, and rub against the raw the nerves of some of those decent common folk because they saw that as being not only immoral, but more importantly, illegal. <coughs> but anyhow, there came a need for another compromise. See, because there was still that pressure being applied to, expense, to extend slavery out into the territories, especially given the war with Mexico in 1840. And then the land acquisitions that included the, um, you know, the Utah Territory, the Mexico Territory, the Arizona Territories, and so on. Now, at that point then, the Congress came up with a third compromise. And this compromise was part of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And in this case, the Congress said that we will allow those who are petitioning for statehood to determine whether they want to come into the Union as a free state or a slave state. They call that popular sovereignty. But you can see how the power of the slave catches, that whole slave industry, have been growing from the Compromise of 1820 20, now up to the Kansas and Nebraska Act. But anyhow, out into the Kansas uh, territory, then there were those that represented free state forces and those that represented slave uh, state forces. And they got to fighting and killing each other. And I suppose that's why they called it Bleeding Kansas uh, today. But anyhow, about five, close to six years later, this fight broke out. One evening in late September 1862, the Reverend came in, and he was quiet. So we knew something was up. So we sat there on our benches and our students, quietly, patiently, waiting for him to speak. And the Reverend said that Mr. Lincoln has just issued a preliminary emancipation proclamation. Now we knew that the word emancipate meant to set free. So you could hear a pin drop in that place. The Reverend went on. The proclamation says that on January the 1st, 1863, that slaves living in states that are in rebellion against the United States or the Union, that those slaves shall be thenceforth and forever free. Now many folks would tell us that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free a single slave. But let me tell you what it did do. It put that sweet smell of freedom in the air to help offset that stench of slavery. And slaves, as they heard through word of mouth that Mr. Lincoln had signed that Emancipation Proclamation, they began to flee those southern farms and plantations by the tens of thousands, many of them continuing on up north into Canada to get away from the long arm of the slave catcher. Others, they fled towards the Union lines, where they helped as spies and as guides and as nurses and as laborers, helping to build fortifications and helping in a number of different ways. The second thing that the Reverend told us, though, a little later on, was that Mr. Lincoln had invited the colored man to join that Civil War fight. And at that point then, we stood up, hugging each other, and we spent the rest of the evening singing songs 
and testifying to the glory and the goodness of the Lord. Because we understood that at that point, our turn had come to put on the blue suit and to get out there and to fight for union and freedom and for the freedom of our people. Now, in response to what the Reverend said was Mr. Lincoln's invitation to the colored man to join the Civil War fight, approximately 180,000 black men signed up to fight with the Union Army. Another 30,000 signed up to fight with the Union Navy for a total of approximately 210,000 black soldiers and sailors fighting under the American flag for union and freedom. Now there in the, over there in the state of Illinois, where I'm from, yeah. it was a group of colored citizens who were the first to approach then Governor Richard Yates with the request that a regiment of colored soldiers be raised there in Illinois to fight on the side of the union. Governor Yates presented that request to the War Department and the War Department gave us approval. So what became known as the Illinois 29th Infantry, the United States Colored Troops, was authorized. Now at that time, I was living up in Quincy, and it was myself, and Washington, and Perkins, a number of us, we, we joined, we signed up. We volunteered on November the 3rd, 1863. We volunteered for three years, or, for the duration of the war. Now, up there in Quincy, Illinois, where I was staying, that's where Company A was organized. Uh, and there were a total of 78 men in our company. But there were total companies that formed, a total of 10 companies that formed our infantry regiment. And by the time the war was over, our regiment had had 1,708 men. We trained in Quincy for a bit, and then we were shipped to Chicago. There, we boarded trains for a trip to Washington, D.C., where we trained for approximately six weeks, and we received the weapons of war, the Springfield 1868 a musket. After training in Washington, we were shipped down to Alexandria, Virginia, and there in Alexandria, we were assigned to the Army of the Potomac, under General George Meade. Now some of you re may remember that General Meade was in charge of the Union forces at Gettysburg. But we were part of the Army of the Potomac under General Meade, the 9th Army Corps under General Burnside, the 4th Division under General Ferrero, the 2nd Brigade. Our first fighting was uh, around Chancellorsville, and that was part of General Grant's James River Campaign. The objective of the James River Campaign was to capture and destroy those Confederate supply lines coming up from the James and the Rapidan Rivers that were being used to uh, supply uh, the Confederate forces that were defending Petersburg and also Richmond. Yeah. So we were involved in a number of skirmishes at that time. Now I should say, that the heavy fighting had already been done before we got there. But that was a highly successful campaign. The next campaign that we were involved in, though, was the Battle of the Crater. And the Battle of the Crater was a very vicious, a very bloody fight with heavy casualties on both sides. The Battle of the Crater was a major Union defeat that didn't have to be, and that defeat was due to poor leadership. And I can talk about that a little later on if you like. Yeah. But anyhow, there were heavy casualties on both sides. On the Confederate side, they had about 1,600 men killed, wounded, missing. On the Union side, they had approximately 3,100 men killed, wounded, missing. Again, that was a very bloody, very vicious fight. After the Battle of the Crater, we were back in the trenches because that we were part of the uh, that was you know part of the overall warfare that uh, uh, that the Union Army was was uh, 
pursuing at that time. So we were, we were in trench warfare for about 11 days. And then we were back in camp for about seven days, resting, recuperating. Following that, we were back out fighting. We were involved in intense fighting along the Weldon Railroad, and then skirmishes around Poplar Grove Church. It was late September 1864 when the War Department reorganized the Army. And we were transferred then from the Army of the Potomac to the Army of the James. The Army of the James under General Edward Orr, the 25th Army Corps under General Wetzel, the 2nd Division, the 3rd Brigade. Following the reorganization, we were back out fighting some more along the Weldon Railroad, as well as Poplar Grove Church and, uh, and Boyton Plank Road. It was April the 2nd, 1865, when our division attacked and destroyed the last Confederate battery defending Petersburg. The next day, uh, uh, we, along with the, my, my, the Army of the James and the Army of the Potomac, marched in and threw uh, uh, Petersburg victorious. But even as we were marching in the Petersburg, then the division to which we had been assigned, the 25th Army Corps, Army of the James, four hours later, marched into Richmond victorious. But that's what they had been doing, a lot of the fighting. And after marching into Richmond victorious, then the, the General Wetzel, the commander of the 25th Army Corps, received the surrender of the city of Richmond from the mayor of Richmond. Now, I should say that the 25th Army Corps, to which we belong, was made up entirely of United States colored troops. There were heavy artillery regiments, light artillery regiments, cavalry regiments, and infantry regiments. One of the cavalry regiments lay at the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the parade into Richmond, led the forces into Richmond, and followed by the Connecticut 29th United States Colored Troops. And you can imagine the joy and the elation of the slaves and the free men who were living there at that time. But while that was going on, our division was detached from the 25th Army Corps and now assigned to the 24th Army Corps, the Army of the James, which along with the Army of the Potomac was in hot pursuit of Lee's Army of Northern Virginia that was trying to escape towards the Carolina Mountains. For the next five days, we pursued them aggressively with, uh, with skirmishes along the way. It was April the 8th, 1865, when Grant trapped Lee's Army of Northern Virginia on a field near Appomattox Courthouse. Yeah. And we were on the western edge of that trap, right next to General Sheridan and his cavalry. The next day, on April the 9th, that was the final fight, and then Lee surrendered his army of Northern Virginia to General Grant. What happened after that? We were shipped back to Richmond, and we, uh, we performed different types of guard duty there until the latter part of May, 1865. And then we were shipped down to Texas and stationed along the Rio Grande in anticipation of a war with France. Mm -hmm. That war then materialized. So on November the 6th, 1865, we received uh, orders that we were being uh, discharged, mustered out, out of service. So we came back to Springfield, Illinois, and there we completed the mustering out process, and we received our final pay. What happened to the men of the 29th? But there are those men who were buried out there in Virginia, but we fought and a number died. There were those men who came back to Illinois and to enjoy their freedom with their children and their grandchildren. And then there were those men who spent two, three, four years walking those southern roads looking for their families that had been ripped apart by slavery, but never finding them. Other outcomes, there was the passage 
of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which outlawed slavery within the United States and all of its possessions. That was the passage of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which gave uh, the free man his civil rights, the, gave the free man and the former slave his civil rights. That was the passage of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which gave the free man and the former slave the right to vote. God has a way of making known to a few souls an idea whose time has come and giving them the courage to lead in spite of the unknown. The idea whose time had come was the idea of expanded freedom. Those given the courage to lead were those slaves who rebelled and fought against the slavery system those abolitionists, abolitionists who railed and came up with different types, types of strategies designed to abolish and end the slavery system within the United States. Those men and some women who put on the blue suit and got out there and, and, and fought for union and freedom. And then there was our great leader, President Abraham Lincoln, whose vision of this great country is reflected in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. And I thank you for listening. So in your platoon, when you said, under general, under his, under this, mm -hmm. and then down here, mm -hmm. was your platoon or your group of, uh, or your company, mm -hmm. considered second class, always got whatever was left over of food and whatever might be left over of money? Well, the thing is that, uh, one, we were clearly considered second, second class people at that time and also ultimately second class citizens. I think that that, you know, that was a harsh reality. In terms of the pay, that was a real issue because the thing is that we were paid, what, $3 less than white soldiers? Mm -hmm. And then, but not only that, for the $10 that we were paid, we had to take our uniform money out of that. Out of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a contention, an ongoing contention. In terms of food, I mean, you know, we, we were fed, we ate, we had to do that in order to survive and fight. So, you know, that was going on. Uh, it, but see, the whole idea of racism, of white supremacy, I mean, that permeated not only the North, I mean, all the South, but also the North. So, the, you know, that, that contention was always there. So we always had to struggle against that. But keep in mind that for the former slave, the issue was freedom. And that was the first, you know, that was the first objective. And after granting, after, you know, achieving that, especially with the 13th you know, Amendment, for example, then, I mean, that brought all kind of relation to us. Uh, and then when, that, when the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment were passed, you know, then that, that also brought even more, you know, joy and, you know, and relation to our hearts. Now, of course, later on when they got into, you know, uh, after Reconstruction and got into all that, that segregation and all that kind of stuff, that gutted the 14th Amendment, that gutted the 15th Amendment, that was a different issue. Do you know how many of your people uh, came across from Missouri into Illinois, not only uh, the route that you took, mm -hmm. but other routes from Missouri into Illinois? It's quite a long stretch there that they it could is. use. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there were several ports, ports where a number of slaves actually escaped into Illinois. Now uh, that, uh, I mean, you know, there were a number of, the Underground Railroad mechanism was pretty, uh, was, was pretty advanced, so that helped. Uh, but then the thing is that seeing all that free soil, then that was high motivation to try to, you know, escape in that direction. In the, the in, in my company, a large percentage of the men in our company were escaped slaves from Missouri. 
Some came up from Kentucky, but, but heavily from Missouri. <coughs> Okay, after they uh, freed the slaves, okay, and what became of these slaves? How, were they, how did they live after they were emancipated? Well, you know, the thing is... What, that, who took care of them? Well, let's, let's, <clears throat> let's be clear on one thing about slavery. It was the slaves who were really doing a lot of the work. So consequently, they had the skills. See, one of the things that was recognized at that time, and was also said and debated even within the Congress, was the fact that if you looked at those slaves, those were natural entrepreneurs because, you know, they were accustomed to taking care of folks, they had skills and so on. They ran those plantations and those farms, so they had all that to, to, to go with. But that's where the whole 40 acres and the mule idea began to evolve too. But see, the thing is that one of the things that one of the things that, um, that happened following the war, and this is one of the part of the Confederate strategy, they, a lot of those slaveholders began to say that, look, if we, can, if we lose this war, what we have to do, we have to maintain our positions to, so that we can get control of those states. You know, once the Yankees leave, once we can grab control of those states, then we can rewrite the laws and we can rewrite right the laws in such a way that we can criminalize a lot of black behavior and throw a lot of them in jail. But more importantly, we can really begin to gut things like the 14th Amendment, which is what they did. They can gut, they gutted the 15th Amendment, you know, the right to vote, which is what they did. Which is why under segregation, for example, you notice that the blacks didn't have, uh, they, were, they were deprived the right to vote. Uh, the whole idea about uh, uh, about civil rights, for example, that was really that was really curtailed. Um, I need to come out of being um, Andrew Lewis <laughs> 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 to finish answering that question. <coughs> we talked about the the passage of the Fourteenth Amendment, right here, which gave the, a free man and former slave his civil rights, but that was gutted, and that's why. That's why the Civil Rights Act of, 1860, of 1964 was so important, because it reestablished the 14th Amendment. We talked about the 15th Amendment where the black man was given the right to vote, right? But under segregation and so on, that was gutted. That's why the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was so important, because it reestablished the 15th Amendment. And see, the whole notion of freedom, when you get down to it, that was gutted in a lot of ways. And that's what that sharecropping was all about, because it was designed to force the, the former slave, you know, back to a point where all he had to do, all he could do, was just work that land and be tied to that land. And then that then began to uh, help those uh, landholders who had invested in those areas. So that was a whole game that was being played there. And we still see some of that stuff being, you know, being played out today. So go ahead. Did the Underground Railroad come through Cedar Rapids? Um, you know, I would suspect that, uh, suspect so, but I don't know for sure. I can't say that. I just don't know. I, you know, the thing is that, I mean, you know, there were people in Iowa who were very supportive of the, you know, of the uh, Underground Railroad movement and also very supportive of, uh, you know, of, of runaway slaves. It came through this area of West Branch. It came through Springdale. Where? Okay. okay. Good. Are you, are you you or are you the soldier? <laughs> <laughs> My question is as a soldier. Okay. Um, as a as a soldier, what was your medical treatment like? Did you have medics? Uh, uh, there were medics. Um, the quality of the medical treatment for the African American soldiers was not as great as it was for the white soldiers. No, 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 no question about that. What about as a veteran then? As a veteran? Well, as a veteran, <laughs> you know, we're, we're back in the whole environment of, of segregation again. And so the thing, and even in civilian life, and so the quality of medicine for, you know, for African Americans, for former slaves, 
wasn't as great as it was, you know, for their white counterparts. No doubt about that. I mean, some of the hospitals, for example, wouldn't even admit uh, blacks. Mm -hmm. So we knew all those things. So, um, you know, a lot of that came out. You mentioned the Battle of the Crater, that it was a severe loss for the uh, Union. Could you uh, talk about that? The Battle of the Crater? Under the Battle of the Crater, General Grant, General Burnside, General Meade, they kept looking through their binoculars and they kept looking at, we're talking about Petersburg now in Virginia. They kept looking at this road, Jerusalem Plank Road. Jerusalem Plank Road was a major supply artery that was supplying uh, the Confederate forces defending Petersburg and also Richmond. And, and they kept saying that if somehow we could sever that road, then what we could do, we could attack in both directions, destroy Lee's army, and end that, army, end that war in 1864. The problem was that was the Confederate trenches protecting Jerusalem Plank Road. And importantly, there was also Fort Pegram that was protecting Jerusalem Plank Road. And that, had, that fort was heavily fortified. And all those commanders were saying that, look, if you try a frontal, a frontal attack there, it's suicide. So they, they, they just naturally step back. But then there were some miners from Pennsylvania, and they kept looking at that. And they, they said that, you know what? What we could do, we could tunnel down underground and tunnel down under Fort Pegram. We can set dynamite there, and we can blow that place up. And, uh, and so Colonel... Uh, one of the colonels from the, uh, one of the regiments in, 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 in the Pennsylvania regiment, uh, not only was he a former miner, but he's also an engineer. And, he's, and uh, he kept looking at that, and so Burnside, General Burnside, asked him if, what, if he would put together a plan showing how that could work. And so he developed a detailed plan, a very sophisticated plan, by the way. Yeah. Burnside took the, took the plan, and he went to Meade, the General Meade, his boss. And he discussed with General Meade. Well, Meade was lukewarm. And so, and then, so then they went to uh, General Grant. Grant, by the way, Grant studied it and said, okay, let's go ahead and give, give this a try. Now, there's a part that I'm not going to get into, and that's the relationship between Meade and Burnside. And uh, the main thing there is at one time, Burnside was the commander of the Army of Potomac. And me was one of was a, one of the core uh, uh, generals. Now that changed. Me was in charge of the Army of the Potomac, and Burnside was commander of the 25th Army Corps. You have to go back to Fredericksburg, where those two guys they had a major conflict, and me never forgot that. And his 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 confidence in Burnside was really low. Okay. Anyhow, after the plan had been approved. Burnside came to the commander of our division, his color division, and said that we're going to, we're going to attack what, uh, we're going to attack the Confederate supply lines, we're going to attack uh, Jerusalem Plank Road, and what we want you to do is to prepare your men to attack and to hold those positions while the rest of the army will flow through, okay, and give you support. And so what happened was that we trained for almost three weeks designed to attack and hold the Jerusalem Plank Road after the explosion had occurred. Now, the training was highly specialized training. Um, there were, the whole idea was to attack around Fort Pedram where the explosion was to, was to occur and not to get down there in that crater. Okay? So, uh, on each side, there was a, uh, a brigade. The lead regiment in each brigade were trained as axemen. Because the thing is that when the attack occurred, it was going to be dark. And the thing is that we were going to have to attack around uh, the crater. But then, once you got to those parapets, the, the, the Confederate uh, trench lines, there were all kinds of stakes and stuff that were protecting it. So the axe men had a responsibility of chopping down those states. 
And so the axe men, when they were charging to the parapets, they were going to go in a single file, three feet apart, each carrying his weapon, extra ammunition, and an axe. And the being three feet apart was critical because once they got to the parapet, if they were pushing on each other, then they were going to push some men into those stakes. And when the early practices occurred, that's exactly what happened, and two men were killed. So now they understood that. So they were to get to the parapet and start chopping out those stakes. They were going to be followed by what was called the ladder man. The ladder man, the regiment of ladder men, each of those regiments were carrying ladders. And then once the stakes were, uh, were chopped down, they were going to throw the, uh, the ladders on, those parapet, on the parapets and then climb over. Once they climbed over, the whole, the whole objective was not to stop there and start fighting with the Confederates in those trenches. The whole objective was to charge towards Jerusalem Plank Road. Once they got to Jerusalem Plank Road, uh, the, uh, the brigade on the left, they were going to turn to the left. And then the brigade on the right, they were going to turn to the right. And they, they figured that the two brigades would be about 200 yards apart. Yeah. And then the rest of the, the army was going to be following them, them in. And at that point, they were going to attack Lee's army in, in two directions. Now, what was critical was that after the explosion occurred, the army figured that, that uh, with that element of surprise, they would have about 30 minutes you know, to work. And so they had to move and move quickly before the Confederates could recover. What happened was that the night before the attack was to occur, literally hours, General Meade changed the plan. And when he changed the plan, he told uh, General Burnside, he said, I want one of your white divisions to lead the attack, as opposed to your colored division. Burnside protested, saying that the, you know, these black troops have been highly trained, they are ready for this, they are motivated, they want to lead this charge. But, Burn, but me wouldn't relent. And so Grant ended up by, by uh, agreeing with his, his top commander. This is where things began to break down. I mean, not only was it a last minute change of command, but General Burnside then, when he went back to his three white commanders, he had them pull straws. And the short straw was pulled by General Letty, the commander of the 1st Division. General Letty was perceived as being the weakest commander in the 25th Army Corps. Grant said later on he thought he was probably the weakest commander in the Army of the Potomac. But anyhow, while his men were out in the parade of fighting later <coughs> on, he was in the back, in the shed, getting drunk. You know, so. Now, but, but the other part of the breakdown was that General Burnside <coughs> did not demand that the commanders of the 4th Division, both the uh, brigade commanders, the regimental commanders, and their top sergeants, meet with the command commanders in the first division and explain exactly what they were what they were doing, what the training was about and you know and how to, you know, and when they had to uh, start the charge. So once the explosion occurred, the first division, instead of charging around the craters, the first thing they did, they started stepping back. Oh, they <coughs> wanted to hit by all that debris that was coming down. You know, and, and, and one understood that. And they stayed back. They backed up about 100 yards. They didn't move for a little bit more than a half hour. At that point, the element of surprise had gone. But, but not only that, instead of charging around the crater, they charged down into the crater. And by that time, the Confederate forces had recuperated. And it just became a duck shoot. And they were just shooting down at the Stilino guys. You know, see, and, um, and our commander then, he followed the, the, uh, the command uh, our regimental commander followed the command down in the crater, trying to, you know, trying to get through, because we knew what the game was. And the other part, though, was a number of the black troops. Once they finally got the order to go in, they started going around the crater. But at that time, you know, things, it was, it was too late. And so, anyhow, that whole uh, battle was a disaster. General Grant said later on, when he was testifying before the Congress, he said that General Burnside wanted his colored division to lead that attack. And I believe that had they led that attack, it would, have been, it would have been a success. And we could have ended this war nine months earlier. Those were his words. 
Uh, there are those that hold that um, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued primarily to break the back of the Southern economy. Now, if we say that the Civil War had not occurred, would that have been, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation been inevitable? Oh, yeah. You know, to some extent, um, I don't want to speculate on that. I mean, because it would be speculation. I mean, the thing is that what Lincoln, I mean, part of, look, Lincoln had a problem with arming uh, black soldiers. Because, you know, early on, as a matter of fact, before he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he thought that they wouldn't fight. As a matter of fact, a lot of the slave masters said that, that uh, a slave will not fight against his master. They've been trained not to fight against their master. That's not going to happen. A lot of Northerners believe that, too. But then what happened, once the war broke out, and you had groups like the Kansas Colored Volunteers fighting, all of a sudden, a number of Northerners began to say, but wait a minute. These guys are fighting, you know, and they're very, they're very vicious in their fighting. Maybe we need to rethink that. And then as they begin to see blacks fighting in other areas, then it hit the newspaper. And not only that, the military commanders began to give that feedback to the War Department. And then a lot of, a lot of soldiers, uh, foot soldiers, when they were in some of those fights, they would look across the way and they say, wait a minute. We see where the Confederates, they're using all these slaves to build these fortifications. Why don't we give them that advantage? Why don't we, and this is what Douglas and those guys are saying, a lot of the abolitionists, they were saying, why don't we go ahead and free those slaves? If you free those slaves, they're going to come to our side because we're talking freedom. They're still talking slavery. So if you do that, then you can drain the resources for them and use those resources on our side. And Lincoln, you know, he began to see all that. And then and he began to change his mind and change his attitude. And then he got to the point where he really saw how the black man could be a real asset in this war. And especially as a lot of the white volunteers began to step back because they were getting war weary. But the slaves, they wanted to get into that fight because they saw it as a chance, you know, to abolish slavery and get their freedom. So that's, you know, that's the reality. That's, that's what, was, what was going on. Um, yes, that was the motivation. The, the whole idea of winning the war was part of Lincoln's motivation. But at the same time, Lincoln really wanted to abolish slavery. And he saw this as a good way of getting that done. And then as he saw how the colored warriors were actually fighting, that's when he began to talk about giving the colored warrior the vote and his civil rights, you know, and the 13th Amendment. That's when he began to think about that. And that's what infuriated a lot of Southerners. And a lot of people say that's when John Wilkes Booth made, decided that he was going to assassinate him. But, <coughs> Right. Do, you, do you remember how your troop got from Quincy, Illinois to Virginia? Was it the railroads? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, at that time, the you know the uh, the major uh, you know connection network uh, railroad network was in Chicago. That's why we were shipped out to Chicago, and then took the train to Washington. A minute ago, you, uh, well, not a minute, maybe 10 minutes ago, you, something slipped and you said, we still have segregation today. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> well, your character didn't, but somehow you said it was still <coughs> evident today. No, I said, you can, the elements of racism and so on are still elements. Are still, are still, you can, I mean, that's, that's still here today. If you ask me whether or not conditions have changed? Obviously. There's no doubt about that. America today is not what America was 100 years ago, not even 50 years ago, not even when they signed the, uh, the, uh, the Civil Rights Bill of, of 1960, 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Things begin to change, and things have changed. What did you guys do for fun? <laughs> now that's, that's good. Yeah. Well, I know that there was, uh, you know, there was some playing of baseball, and uh, you know, and then uh, I'm sure that there was some of the soldiers who had who came up with some ways in which they could uh, maybe, you know, gamble a little bit. You know, see, as all soldiers did, um, 
you know, they, and um, I guess they had a little different fun and games. Um, <laughs> you know, but... So anyhow, I mean, that, that, that was, that, that's... I'm not sure that they, um, you know, that they had kites and all those kind of things that, uh, you know, young people have today, but anyhow. And on that note, um, let's all show our appreciation.